it's a pretty straightforward approach to sort of introducing you to the um, the role that statistics have in biologi biological sciences. How many of you have had a stats course before? Probably most of you at some point. Okay, so you've probably gone over this and done this. Okay, uh, if you need her contact information, it's there, and she will be back for the next class where she's teaching. Is it just Thursdays? Okay, so she'll be back next Thursday, and then you'll see her for the rest of the course. Does everyone have their eye clickers with them today? Okay, please take those out. And are yours the white or the blue? All right, so mine's the blue. So this is another, I haven't used an eye clicker in about 10 years, and I know the technology's changed, so I'm gonna try my best with that. first before we actually get to using the eye clickers. We have some examples that will have you work through, so you should have either a calculator out, your cell phone if you have one on there, um, a piece of paper, uh, whatever you need to do some of the calculations. But first, just to give you a brief int introduction into hypothesis testing, which of course is central in many of the sciences, but especially biology as well. And you all know what a normal distribution is. Someone give me an example of a normal distribution height of humans. So if we sampled everybody in this room, the height of everybody in this room, and we plotted it, it would most likely come out to be a normal distribution. If I picked four of you, sampled your height, would it be a normal distribution? Probably not. So generally, the more samples you take, that's very important in approximating what a normal distribution is. We're gonna use the one sample z-test today, which is if you have one score that you select out of that distribution, you can ask lots of different questions. For example, if I measure one person, the height of one person, where do they fall on this normal distribution? Uh, are they in the 95th percentile, 75th percentile? So for example, as you're growing up, the doctor always meant, measured you height and weight and it'd give you a percentile, everyone remembers that, right? So essentially what they're doing is using a z-score to see where you fall within that. Uh, she also wanted me to let you know that there is a detailed z-test handout on Gaucho space, so make sure you look at that uh, if you're unclear after today in my attempt to uh, deliver this information to you. Okay, populations, what is a population? Tell me what you think a population is in a biological sense. Everyone knows this. Yeah. Okay, so that's a good ecological definition. He said two or more organ organisms of the same species in the same living in the same area. So yes, that's definitely an ecological definition. So when we talk about a population. In a, from a biological or ecological perspective. We're talking about, for example, humans would be a population. You can split that up into looking at, for example, if you go back thousands of years when humans lived more discreetly, you can talk about one population versus another, but you can talk about that in any particular area. We define a population based on what we're studying. In statistics, that's a little different. When we talk about a population in statistics, we're really talking about all individuals that we could possibly sample um, depending on what our question was. So we could, we could ask, for example, we could define the population as all students at UC Santa Barbara. Or we could define the population as all humans in the world. Or we could even define a population as all students in this room, in this, in this particular class, in this particular room. And that would be our sampling um, group, per se. That differs from a sample, whereas that's a subset of the population. So a, a population is all potential individuals you could sample. A sample is a subset of that. So say we only had five minutes to sample everyone's heights, I would never get through measuring each and every person. So we could take a random sample of this class, that would be your sample. So just make sure you know the distinction, distinction between what a population and what a sample is. <coughs> Uh, there are a lot of important statistics or parameters 
of populations and samples. And one thing I want to write down here. <sighs> So when we're talking about a statistic of a population, we call it a parameter. Whereas when we talk about a statistic, when we're talking about a sample, we then call that a statistic. So I, I use statistic for both of these, but there really is sort of a difference between that. So when we're talking about statistics, we can use lots of statistics for populations when we're taking measurements. What are some of those statistics we can measure in a population? And it really depends on what you want to measure. So let's go back to height. What, what aspects of height can we, um, I don't want to say measure because that's one measurement. Height is the measurement. But what attributes of height can we analyze? or um, take a mathematic statistic of? I don't know if you're clear on that, yeah. Average height. Okay, so average height. Uh, the proportion below by like a certain height. Okay, potentially proportion below. That sort of actually even gets into the z-score aspect of this. But a little simpler than that. So average, or we call it the mean. Yeah. The range. The range. What are some other? statistics instead of range. We don't often use range. That is one, but what do we usually use? Someone said it. Standard deviation is an important one. What else? So there's the median. We don't use that very often, the mode. There's standard error, which I'll talk about today. There's a whole range of things you can um, calculate to describe a population or a statistic. And I just want to make you aware of that. So for what we're doing today, when we're analyzing questions using a z-score, we're going to generally use the mean, the standard de deviation, but only to calculate the standard error, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, did you go over the empirical rule in lecture? No. No? Okay. So empirical rule is essentially a measure of uh, central tendency, it ha really has to do with uh, a normal curve. And I also want to point out that there are many different types of distributions. Nor normal distribution is what we use the most, but in biological data, uh, for example, if we're using count data, so say you have an insect laying eggs on two different plant species, and you're counting the number of eggs they lay, that may not necessarily follow a normal distribution. Oftentimes, many individuals won't lay any eggs. So you get lots of zeros and then a couple of the other numbers and what that does is it skews the data. So you have a different sampling distribution. Sometimes we ask questions where it's binomial or categorical where we say yes or no. Or say if it's flower color, we're evaluating flower color or phenotypes in the population, we may have red or pink or red or violet. And then you're only gonna have two particular measures and that's called a binomial distribution. So that's important to remember as well. We most often talk about normal distributions, but there are several of other types of distributions, and that's really going to determine how you go about your statistical analysis. So with the normal distribution, essentially what the empirical rule states, um, I guess I should mention standard deviation first, because that's important. 
often, um, given the symbol sigma, the Greek, uh, Greek letter uh, sigma, but standard deviation essentially is a measure to sh uh, tell you how much any particular measurement deviates from the mean. So here I do the mean on the standard curve. <coughs> And then generally what we do is we evaluate one standard deviation, this would be minus one in this case, or one standard deviation, two standard deviations in one direction, and then three standard deviations. And what the empirical rules state is that about 68% of all individuals will fall within one standard deviation, either in a positive or negative direction, of whatever that average or mean is of the population. And then 95% will fall within two standard deviations. And then lastly, about 99.7% of all individuals will fall within, standard, within three standard deviations. So if your population follows a normal curve or is normally distributed, very few individuals, and it's less than 0.03, or less than 0.3, sorry, will fall outside of that range. So almost everything that you sample, all individuals will fall within three standard de deviations of what the mean is. So that's what the empirical rule states. So for standard deviation, you don't need to do the calculations today. We're gonna to give you the standard deviation. Uh, but you may need to calculate the standard error. Generally, a standard deviation is, well, generally standard deviation is always larger than standard error. And standard error is derived from standard deviation by the formula. So I'm going to call it SE equals the standard deviation divided by the square root of your sample size that you're taking over that population. And so I almost never use sigma, and if you read a scientific paper, you're never going to see sigma. What you see is SD, so I'm going to include that as, there as well, just for simplification. And so if you're talking about one, one particular score, in the Z, when you're using a z-score test, you can use a standard deviation. When you're talking about a range of scores, so for example, if I wanted to select 10 of you to determine if the measure, if I take the average of 10 heights in this class, is that similar to the whole class? Because I have a range of individuals, I'm taking 10, not just one score, we're gonna use the standard error instead of the standard deviation. So sometimes you see with the Z, and the only point I'm making is, every once in a while, and if you look in stats books, oftentimes they'll use the standard deviation in calculating the Z-score. Uh, sometimes, but other times they use the standard error. Today we're gonna to be using the standard error because you'll notice from the um, examples that we have, we're taking a number of individuals from that population, we're not looking at just one score. So this is sort of another difference between how we talk about hypotheses in biology and hypotheses in statistical testing. Oftentimes when we, we develop a hypothesis in biology, it's related to what we're studying, but it's also based on previous information that we collect about whatever that biological phenomenon is. In hypothesis testing, I mean in statistical testing, it's very straightforward. If you have a null hypothesis, that means there's no change or no difference between groups. And then the alternative hypothesis is that there is a difference between groups. So sometimes students are a little unclear about that, and when we talk about biological hypotheses versus statistical hypo hypotheses, there's some um, unclarity there. So just, I want you to also understand that point today, that what we're talking about is statistical hypothesis testing when we're talking about a hypothesis. And that's gonna become more clear also in a minute when I give you some of the examples. So again, the null hypothesis, there's no, no difference. So for example, if I measured 10 heights from this class, the null hypothesis would be there's no difference between those, the, the average of those 10 heights and the class average of height. Whereas the alternative hypothesis could be there is a difference, or the alternative hypothesis could be that those 10 heights are larger than the average, or those 10 heights are smaller than the average. 
And that really depends on, again, what you want to what you want to ask when you're um, evaluating evaluating whatever parameter you are. So why don't we just sort of randomly, so if we measured the whole class or we knew what the height of the class was, but then I selected 10 random individuals, got an average and compared them and say the class average was <coughs> five feet, seven inches, but then the average of those 10 was five feet, nine inches. Why can't I say, okay, yeah, that's different. The average of the 10 is definitely much bigger than the average of the class. Why do we use statistics instead of just sort of eyeballing it? What, is stati what, did, what do statistics give us? Confidence level, a measure of I don't want to say a measure of accuracy, it can do that for you, but a measure of uncertainty, it tells you how certain you are um, or what the error rate is in what you're doing. That's very important because we really can never say um, truly confidently that what we find is exact. And so we need some, some measure of how exact we really are or the level of error that we're making in our measurements. <laughs> So we can do a whole range of statistical tests based on what our questions are. Today I mentioned we're gonna do a Z-score. Many of you, how many of you done a T-test? Everyone, probably everyone in the room has done a T-test. So that's for a normal distribution as well, but it's really for testing other types of questions. Uh, how many of you know what an, an ANOVA is? An, an, an analysis of variance, that's another one. That uses an F statistic. So I've just given you, given you three test statistics. You have a Z for a Z-score, a T from a T-test, or an F if you're dealing with an ANOVA. Um, and there are lots of different statistical tests. So that's what we mean when we're talking about a test, test statistic. And it is unitless. So we do this calculation, you come up with a number, but there are no units based on that number. Oftentimes you have to compare it in a table. Today, you, you don't have to, but if you were going to compare your Z-score or your Z-statistic, you'd use a Z-table. There's a T-table, there's an F-table, and oftentimes you find those in the back of statistics books. P-value is another important aspect. The P-value, um, here it says it's the probability of obtaining a test statistic at least as extreme as what you actually observe, assuming the null is true. I'm not really sure what that means. Um, the way I look at p-values is there is some ambiguity depending on who's talking about a p-value. But it's sort of the level of accuracy that you get. Uh, what level do we use in biology? 0 0.05, which is a 5% error rate. So what we're expecting is that 95% of the time we're not making an error or a type 2 error. Um, again, I think beyond the scope of what we're doing. In the medical sciences, um, when they're doing medical research, they don't use 0.05, what do they use? <laughs> what error rate would you use if you're taking someone's life into your own hands? Very stringent. Yeah, usually they use 0 0.01 or 0 0.001. So for some reason in science, in the general sciences, we pick 0.05 as, okay, that's our level that we can live with. <laughs> But you really can, as a scientist, determine what level is appropriate for you, and that's another important point to make. So for today, we're gonna to use the standard 0 0.05 for a p-value, so the probability, so that's gonna be important as well. Okay, so for the two examples we're gonna go over um, for today, some of the, um, Parameters that you're going to need to, need to know, actually, I should call them statistics. We're going to have a parameter and a statistic for the z-test. And it's a very straightforward uh, formula for doing that. It's up there. So your z-score equals p minus the mean divided by the standard error. So p for this is your sample mean, mu, which is the population mean, and then sigma, which is the standard error. And that sigma is different from this. Actually, we write this sigma for standard error, error, like that. But don't worry about that. You just know, just understand that we're using standard error today. That's what that means in that 
And so you come up with a Z statistic for the particular question you have. Oftentimes, as I mentioned, you compare that Z statistic to the table. We do that for you today. We're gonna to give you the P value. Really what we want you to do is identify what the null hypothesis is, what the alternative hypothesis is, and if you're gonna accept or reject the null hypothesis. So we're giving you the P value for you to do that today. Okay, so here's where I need to set up 